right, well, thank you very much for an engaging second part of your presentation and for actually uh, having the initiative to come up with and complete this volume, uh, which I thoroughly enjoy reading. Um, so, um, I was thinking about what to do in this intervention, and uh, there's one thing that I would not do, because it's pretty much the dullest thing one can do in a book discussion, which is to say everything that I agree with, and the things that are praiseworthy in your work. And there are many things that I actually that actually resonated very well with me, ranging from the non-completely individualistic and rather relational conception of cuts across the model, uh, the implications that are proposed uh, along organic, sensory motor, and participatory uh, dimensions of the links between language, body, society, and the overarching historical contexts in which these semiotic uh, events take place, and uh, that the overall inactive uh, premise underlying the, the proposal. So I will not uh, focus on those things. The second thing I would not do is to uh, just um, cherry pick two or three things that I do not agree with or that create some sort of cognitive dissonance uh, in my experience of your, of your book. Uh, and there are a number of those things uh, ranging from the uh, problems and potential contradictions between the individuation of entities and the assumption that everything is relationally defined or the perhaps even dubious implications of notions such as incompleteness uh, or the endorsement of notions that mm, at least uh, do not straightforwardly fit a fully embodied conception of language and meaning, in particular the very uh, uh, conception of symbols or the omissions of key constraints such as body-brain mappings, the role of expectation and prediction, and the distribution of sem semiotic streams uh, along parallel bodily channels and so on. I would not do any of those things. What I would do is perhaps incur in a little exercise of selfishness. And what I will do is I'm going to raise some questions that keep me up at night and that your book has very felicitously uh, rekindled in my mind and uh, just pick your brains to see how you can uh, you and your model can help me and maybe everyone here uh, think about those things uh, see what the connections with problems that I would mention are and hopefully um, help us, help me at least think about feasible ways of uh, facing those those issues. So, um, oh, we can do this Wonderful. All right. So this is, if I were to put it in a nutshell, my uh, synopsis of uh, your book. Um, in my view, what you set forth is an inactivist, embodied, situated, intercorporeal account of the continuities between language and dynamic co-determinations with the rich socio-historical sensory motor frames shaping the flow of daily interactions. Uh, having tasked me with uh, the mission to write a blurb for the back cover, this is what, what I would have uh, produced. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope my um, brief uh, summary of your volume is at least partially sensible and that it uh, does merit to your work. Uh, and regarding my reaction, as I said before, I share many of the wide-ranging principles that are advanced in your book, often captured to different degrees of success and with different degrees of compatibility with your own proposal by specific incarnations of the what is now nowadays called the 4 EA cognition program. Um, but the, the, the main thing is this, I mean, uh, my own linguistic body is heavily marked by sustained experiences in cognitive neuroscience. I was first trained as a linguist and uh, with some readings in philosophy, and then a number of things happened and I ended up being a full-blown laboratory guy. And uh, revisiting these theoretical and philosophical premises that are set forth in the book, uh, 
has confronted me once again with the tensions between overarching conceptions of language and the dynamic co-determinations of language and body and society and the constraints with which it can be fruitfully studied in laboratory settings. In other words, uh, most scientific and particularly neuroscientific experiments capable of informing aspects of linguistic bodies are hatched in the meager overlaps between epistemic convictions and methodological possibility. With this I mean all those premises that are so eloquently set forth in your book, and many of which I insist I share wholeheartedly, uh, can only, um, let's say, they do not lend themselves to direct applications to uh, laboratory settings because we are uh, limited, constrained by methodological, technical, technological uh, uh, features of what can and cannot be done for an experiment to be internal and externally valid, to be reliable, to be feasible, even. So, it is in these meager overlaps of what I think things are, my like ontological and epistem epistemological and sociological commitments, and what a laboratory setting actually allows me to do, that I find only meager overlaps. And it would be very good for a model to be explicit about how we can address those overlaps, how we can profit from those overlaps, and even more importantly, whether it can extend the space of overlap. The, the intersection between what we genuinely believe the world, the language, and linguistic bodies to be, and what the laboratory offers us to experimentally tackle those things. As it happens, the uh, laboratory and experimental science is, in my view at least, the powerhouse of any non-rationalist and exclusively speculative approach to, uh, to, to, to any scholarly topic. So, this is pretty much the overall platform whence I will be enunciating the things I have to say now. My game plan here is to identify some of the practices distancing mainstream laboratory research from a full-blown incarnation of the author's key notions autonomy, adaptivity, sense-making, agency, participatory sense-making, and reflect on how this limits, but also fuels, ongoing theoretical and translational breakthroughs in numerous interdisciplinary spheres. So, let me tackle these issues one by one, merely to provide a set of initial reflections aimed at prompting discussion. That is my humble goal this morning here. There are a number of tensions. The first one of which is what I, in a book that we published, a couple of years ago, we referred to as a scientific catch-22 between experimental control and ecological validity. So, basically, something that we do at the lab is, when we are studying language or facial processing or, or emotional processing, is we carefully choose a set of words or faces, uh, we organize them in two or three contrastive conditions, we try to match them for a number of critical relevant variables, and make sure that they differ ideally only in one critical target manipulated variable. Uh, then we have our participants perhaps lie down in an MRI scanner or sit very quietly and, and in a very still fashion uh, while we attach 128 electrodes on their scalp or while we apply uh, electrical currents on their brains and things like that. We tell them to uh, be very still, to be silent, not to blink too much, things like that, and to respond to the stimuli. So, if you think about this, uh, that situation that a, a laboratory, an experiment participant faces in the laboratory is never to be faced again the moment he walks out of my lab. There's not a single moment in his life in which we would find that same scenario. So, what we are doing is we are sacrificing ecological validity. What we are looking at at the lab is tremendously uh, distanced from how uh, life actually flows in the kaleidoscopic flux of 
unpredictable dynamicities that can defy what we do in any daily scenario. Now, the alternative would be to just, you know, try to measure brain activity while people are just engaging everyday dealings with the environment. You know, we talk and I hold my child when I'm having breakfast, things like that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we cannot do that because if you can isolate variables, then all you have is neural noise, which is uninterpretable. So that's a scientific catch-22 that uh, frames uh, this meager overlap, mainly, that I was referring to. And this would be like the overarching question um, I would like to present the authors with, to see whether they, they see there is a way to resolve this. But then I would like to uh, instantiate this overarching problem by referring to specific manifestations of it. Uh, in the lab, for instance, we use atomistic decontextualized stimuli. Yeah? So in the, in the top figure, uh, which has been degraded unfortunately because of the conversion to a, a PDF file here, trust me, it's, it's much nicer. Uh, you see a typical uh, experimental paradigm, so maybe I will have the subject's face uh, a fixation cross and I will have a very, very small grammatical context which is kept constant, I am, and then I will present them with two types of verbs, action verbs, abstract verbs, and then pseudo verbs. All the participants have to do is press a key if the verb they are seeing is real in their language and another key if it is not real. So, uh, this is again something that never happens. I'm actually quite satisfied to learn that my participants do not face situations in their daily lives in which they have to respond to 200 isolated words. I mean, that would be uh, uh, a highway to psychosis, probably, right? Um, but, uh, so this is a limitation. This is a way in which we, the, the, the typical experimental design, falls short of operationalizing notions such as uh, adaptivity and, and sense making in any realistic, embedded, embodied, uh, inactive sense of the term. Now, there are alternatives. Something that we have been working on is, work, is to design texts, naturalistic texts, narratives that are carefully controlled, matched by many, many variables, but that's something that we, the researchers, know. In the eyes of the, of the participant, the stories look just as natural as any other story they may come across. So, there's this problem and there's this alternative to facing uh, the, the use of atomistic decontextualized stimuli while still retaining methodological control of what you're doing. But is this enough? That's one of the questions I want to leave out there for the authors. Um, not only are the stimuli artificial, but the task settings that we use at the lab are also artificial. So for instance, in the, in the top panel, the top figure, you can see a typical paradigm in which uh, on a dynamic screen, on a tablet screen, participants, there, there, there is a dot, they have to place their finger on a dot, then different types of words will appear, and then the dot will move, and the participants have to slide their finger, trying to change the dot. What we are doing is we are measuring uh, the time it takes the hand to move, the finger to slide. And the, the key here is that some of the verbs are action verbs, referring to movements of the hand, and some other verbs are action verbs, referring to movements of the feet. So what you see is that when the effector that is being described by the language matches the effector that you're using to chase the dot, there are predictable facilitation or interference effects. Okay, that's very useful in my, in my, in my view, but that is an art and, and, and completely artificial situation. Nowhere in real life do you find yourself doing that. I really hope you don't. Really <laughs> now, there are some alternatives to uh, naturalizing, ecologizing a little bit, the, 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 the research on the mappings between effector-specific words and effector-specific movements. Something that we have been using, for instance, is digital tablets, in which we have participants write, just write words as, as they would normally do it at, uh, in their home. The beauty of this is that the pen that we are using can allow you to track reaction time, uh, the pressure that you apply on the pen, and you can uh, extract data from this. So this is a way to improve things. But again, is this enough? How does this really tally with the, uh, the necessities, if you will, of a full 
experimental incarnations of the linguistic body's framework. And is this informative to the framework at all? Or is this just so distant from the uh, big picture type of ideas in the model that this is just irrelevant uh, for the model? Another thing is that, and this is this really distances uh, experimental research from the premises of the model, especially for participatory sense-making notions, which is the predominance of individualistic and spectatorial paradigms in laboratory research. Basically, 99.9995% of experiments in the world involve a single person facing a computer screen. And unfortunately, now it's, that is a little bit more ecological. I do spend a lot, an awful lot of time on my own facing a computer screen, but uh, I do spend a lot of time interacting with people, and we are doing right now, like we do over lunch, and, and, and uh, I don't know, like sharing a coffee or something. Now, it is only, only rarely that experimental science actually explores what happens linguistically, cognitively, uh, bodily, if you will, when when two people are interacting. Yeah? Now, there are alternatives to this. There is, for instance, the hyperscanning approach, in which you can track brain activity not from one, but from, 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 from two people at the same time while they are engaging in participatory activities. For example, you can have two MRI scanners, and you can have a chess game such that the two participants whose brains are being activated are uh, competing against each other. Or you can have uh, dual EEG scans of people while they are talking to each other, facing one another, or when they are back to back. And you can see different mo uh, modulations, brains of people coupling different ways when they are in a more realistic uh, participatory environment than when they are in an isolated or a non realistic like back to back participatory environment. So I wonder if these are. Uh, contributions and limitations of science that have any bearing on what the model is and what the model can actually contribute to science. Uh, also, there is, uh, uh, regarding adaptivity for instance, uh, in laboratory research there is a predominance of repetitive as opposed to dynamic and partially unpredictable task settings. If you do one of my verb processing experiments, you will see just 200 words and you have to press one here or the other for like roughly 15 minutes. Press Greek words, press keys. Greek words, press keys. There's no dynamicity. There's no unpredictability. And uh, if something typifies our real engagement with the environment as linguistic bodies, is that we do not know what the immediate and the, and the proximate and the distant future will hold for us. We, I do not know if there's going to be a dog barking at me when I go uh, to the corner. I have no idea what you're going to respond to me right now as authors. That is completely left out of experimental designs. There are alternatives to this. For example, using virtual reality. You can create partially unpredictable scenarios, but whose unpredictability you can control as a designer or a researcher. So again, is this something that can be factored in the model? Can the model illuminate and shed light on how to better capitalize on these alternatives? And um, also, you know, we favor tailor-made models of couplings between language and action. Like I was telling you, if you want to explore how the specific uh, meaning or the dominant meaning that is evoked by a word uh, affects effector compatible actions, we use these, you know, uh, very neat experiments. But the truth is that when bodily action is coupled with language in real life, there is no such uh, experimental control. My hands are moving in ways that cannot be fully controlled and operationalized based on what I'm looking at, what I'm hearing, what my affective status is, what my attentional load is, what I'm trying to convey, what I know, what I do not know, and all of that is also left out from typical experimental paradigms. Finally, and this is perhaps like the broadest question of all, is that methodological, uh, the, 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 the constructs that we uh, subscribe to our epistemic and definitional and notional and categorical convictions are sub-determined by the way in which we methodologically operationalize. So we want to study the coupling between language and action, for instance. And we have a, a selection of 100 carefully controlled verbs while participants press one button or, or the other. And then 
with that very small scale uh, rendition of what we are interested in exploring, we come up with broad generalizations about how language couples bodily action. So, is that are those generalizations uh, warranted? Are we always self-determining what we are concluding? Um, is the self-determination that we find in laboratory uh, useful, partially useful, completely relevant to your model and to an overarching understanding of linguistic bodies in their full situated manifestation? There's another question, or perhaps a variation of the one question that I have for the authors. So many of these tensions, and this is my final thought here, though partially approachable, may ultimately be marked by an ontological conundrum. Although we can ask and answer questions about linguistic processes and experiences, about linguistic bodies even, those processes, those experiences, in their unicity, in their actual uh, manifestation in the movement, if you will, remain directly unperceivable in their essential totality, so that we can only imperfectly infer them to their partial physical proxies. With this reflection, I have a concluding, rather a non-concluding question, which is, can the linguistic body's proposal help disentangle these braided problems? And if, if I may tease apart this question a little bit more, I guess the questions are, and I do not expect uh, an answer to all of them, I'm just going to uh, mention a few so that the authors can perhaps choose the one that they think they are in a better position to address in the immediacy of this uh, uh, interaction. Is the model at all informed by laboratory research? It was not clear to me when I read the book. Does it attach any value to these spectatorial, individuated, non-unpredictable uh, designs that we in cognitive neuroscience and neurolinguistics constantly profit from. Second, can the model promote applicable or applicable ideas to resolve the tensions that I just uh, enumerated? Third, can the model constrain or illuminate interpretations of the findings that are derived therefrom from laboratory research? And finally, what type of experiments could falsify the model? To me, it is very important to understand what could render a model or a hypothesis false. And uh, the main way I uh, find to do that, in addition to just thought experiments and uh, introspection, is by conducting experiments. So, I would appreciate if the authors could explicitly highlight the type of experimental evidence that could uh, jeopardize, compromise, uh, refute, partially falsify their models or partial conceptions therefrom. That is all I have to say right now, so thank you for your time and attention.